Hey, Yvette, great to see you. Thank you so much uh, for being here today and for having this conversation. Are you okay? Um, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I think this is, um, it is absolutely fantastic um, to be here with you today, Marcus. Great, thank you. Well, we're going to talk about racism. Uh, you know, there's loads going on. I and mean, if you're watching today, um, it's an ever-changing situation. So this is Tuesday, the 2nd of June. I think we're in now with COVID as well. It's hard to know what day um, or date it is. Yeah. But, um, I just know that the situation's changing in America. So just to let you know, this is Tuesday, the 2nd um, of June. But we want to talk about the situation that's kind of sparked um, off with George Floyd, but also... Um, how that affects our nation um, as well. This isn't just an American problem. Um, this is a humanitarian problem um, in, my, in my eyes. So it's great that we can talk openly um, about racism today and to have you a bet with us. Um, I want to give you permission to speak openly and honestly um, yeah. about your experiences and about what, you, about what you feel as well. I think we've avoided the subject for too long um, in the past I know I've avoided the subject um, I've not done it I've not mentioned it. I've not talked about you know black history month or I've not talked about racism and I think mm. partly because um, you may, maybe I've been too scared maybe I've not realized how real it is um, until hearing stories uh, and maybe even I thought oh even speaking about racism that makes it more real there's not really a mm. problem there um, but if I speak about it, it makes it a problem. Um, but actually, that's just me being incredibly uh, naive. Uh, about no, um, to be honest, Marcus, I don't think it's just you. Because even for me, um, being a black person, this week, um, I had to get inspiration. I, I had to get like an awakening because it's not just you. I also had that um, feeling of, oh, you know, let me just be quiet. Like, I don't want to sound controversial. You, you don't want to be labeled as a troublemaker and all that. Um, and it was, it, it, it was a really... Um, great awakening for me um going back into esther and um letting the lord lead me into that um verse and it's one that has stuck with me the last couple of weeks um esther chapter 4 mm. verse 14 um you know and it, it talks about you, those who have who are familiar with the passage um it leads to the point where esther was supposed to go into to the king and she was being urged to go because that there was a time that there's a purpose for her being where she was at that point and that is what I felt the Lord um telling me to do because I was also just shielding away from it because it's not comfortable um I don't want to be perceived as like um oh you're just starting trouble or it, it's just it, it's just not a very comfortable thing to talk about whether you're black or um you're wow. white so I just thought oh, I'm just going to stay in my comfort zone um until I had that revelation that actually no um it, it needs to be talked about it needs yeah. to be um looked at and so I had to let go of um my own discomfort um to to make a difference and it, it's just about talking like you um you mentioned it, it's it's having that conversation as uncomfortable as it might be it's it's just speaking out yeah thank you thank you that's that's incredible to hear as well um an encouragement for us all yeah it might be uncomfortable but we've got to speak out about it we've been silent too long and um i guess you know one of the things this week i've just heard loads of stories um where it's just highlighted to me that it's it's real. So a friend of mine shared, um, you know, on Facebook um, about how her her husband had been there had been a big car crash. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily his fault. He was um, he was the last one impacted. Um, and then the police were just interviewing everyone, taking their names and numbers. And him as a black man just got com treated completely differently um, to the white people. Um, as well. And then I watched uh, an interview with between Carl Lentz uh, and Bishop Jakes, um, a phenomenal interview. Um, and again, Bishop Jakes just sharing stories how, you know, he's, there can be fear for, for his yeah. kids, you know, dealing with um, the police. And we're not saying all police are racist or anything like no. that, but, <laughs> but it, it's so real. And I, yeah, and we've just got to speak out about it, share these stories so that actually yeah. we are um, aware. I don't think as a white person, um, I'll ever be able to fully understand 
what what it is like to be black in this day and age um yeah. but that doesn't mean we can't stand uh with you and try to understand and so this is a great opportunity for us all to learn to have this conversation um and kind of yeah grow from it so uh about how does it feel for you to be a black person in workshop um to be very honest um i'm i don't I don't really, I, I can't honestly say that I experience like a lot of racism. Mm. If I do, I, I probably don't see it um, because I, I, it's not something that I, I really look out for. Um, again, probably because I have got a mixed um, family as well. Yeah. Um, so I may be treated a little bit differently um, because you you know you go in because my husband is white um, so maybe that um, would also influence it but if I have to be very honest I can't say that I've actually experienced um, racism you know uh, myself being in workshop um, but I, I think that it's so important we've got a local a Ghanaian adage um, that says it's only a fool that says it's somebody else it's not me um, mm. and I know that I have got kids especially um who are boys and for boys for most of the times they're treated differently wow. i've got my um my cousins um, my nephews my my sister my big sister lives in london and so every time when we go the conversation especially um when the uh, uh, the boys going out is you can't wear a hood you can't do this you can't um, speak to someone you you cannot act in any way that um gives any the slightest bit of suspicion that you know you may be up to something um so even there are certain things that my sister doesn't let him wear um some clothes are off limits to him just because he is very tall um and he's black um so those are some of the things that you know you you deal with um being being a black person um in a predominantly white um community wow. um and I think it was really interesting when you mentioned um, Cal Lens because I've had like this last week, he was one of the people who really influenced me as well. Um, Cause um, again, I, I think I try to not let racism, I, I don't really dwell on it so much um, because I think my primary identity is being a child of God. Wow, and that has incredible. been something, <laughs> you know, that yeah. has been something that helps me so much. So I think when you talk about um, how is it like being a black person in workshop? The honest truth is, I really don't give a lot of thought to it. Um, again, it's because one, I, I, I see myself as a child of God, and and that's period. You know, I'm not better than someone who is white, and someone who is white is not better than me. It's as simple as that. Um, but I also have to be real and know that for some people, they have been brought up in a different mindset. There are prejudices that might work against me. Um, but even when I go for a job interview or I apply for a job, this is my deal with God. Take me where you want me to go. So even when I don't get it, I don't really link it back to me being black or not because again, I just go back to my faith and my trust in God to say that he is gonna provide for me what he wants me to get. And, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a passage that he tells us um, in John, and I absolutely love it, that there's nothing that we, we can get that has not been given to us by God. So that is my first and most important way that I, I handle myself, and that is being a child of God. Um, but when I was talking about um, Carl Lenz, he, he talked about the, you know, Black Lives Matter, because mm. I was one of those who was thinking, oh, it's a bit dramatic, everything, or Black Lives this, Black Lives that, like, do we really have to, you know, do that or say it in that way? Um, but he said something interesting um, with regards to that. And he said that, you know, all lives matter, right? Um, but until all lives matter equally, this is the focus right now. Yeah. And so I had to pause. I had to, you know, go back to admit that, yes, I was wrong in thinking that people are overreacting um, with saying Black Lives Matter. It does matter because at this point it needs to be highlighted because it feels like it doesn't matter as much. It doesn't matter as equally. And so for some people, if you're like me who are thinking that, oh, like they're just making everything about themselves, even the phrase and all that, that is where it's coming from. So just to give a bit of, um, you know, understanding, yeah. um, for instance, to that phrase. 
That's great. And I saw, um, maybe, maybe you've seen it, maybe people watching have seen it. There's a cartoon going round of like a house on fire. Um, yeah. And so one, the fireman's putting it out and the man, the neighbor, the neighboring house is saying, well, how it's not fair because you're putting out my hat. You're that house, but you're not putting out, yeah. uh, you're not putting water on my house, but the other man's house isn't on fire. And so yeah. again, I don't think you're saying, I don't think anyone's saying, yeah, um, that all lives don't matter. Yes, all lives <laughs> matter. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, we've, we've got to put the focus where the fire is um, exactly. right now. <laughs> Uh, and exactly. there's, I think it's, it's clear to see there's just a lot of pain and people need to be listened to um, yeah. right now because, I yeah. mean, there's, you know, you know, in the American context and there's 400 years of, mm. um, yeah, yeah, of this oppression. Uh, yeah. And in England as well, there's, you know, there's so much oppression. Um, yes. And so people have got to be heard. Uh, and yes, so black lives do matter. I think All the lives two matter. countries deal with it a bit differently. So in America, they're obviously like a lot more, you know, in your face kind of thing. And mm. in the UK, it's it's a lot more like um, passive aggression kind of thing, you know. So people might not necessarily um, tell you to your face, um, but you know that you're kind of you're maybe excluded from things. I mean, I had uh, there instances where. Um, before we we used to live in Hinckley, where my my oldest um, son he wasn't included in in certain parties, and no. everybody pretty much all the boys like if it was a boys' party for instance, pretty much all the boys will have an invitation, and um, he he wouldn't be invited, um, and it's just those things, and I can't you know I can't control those, um, I can't control how he reacts to it, how he sees it. I've got to be honest with him. Um, to let him know that you know what at the end of the day not everybody is going to like you whether we're all white or all black um, mm. but sometimes the fact that you you may um, you know have black uh, blood would give people a setting liking or dislike to you and it's something that you have to deal with um, so you need to just know that um, it's not for you to go out and just start acting like oh, a victim and if somebody doesn't like you or if they don't like me because I'm black, no. Um, but it's just to let you not be naive as well to think that, oh, everything is okay because everything is not okay. We're, we're working, it's a work in progress and we're still working on it, but you, you do need to know the truth so that you'll be able to deal with it accordingly. Mm. Do you think the church can be racist as well? I'm, I'm nervous of asking this, but we've got to learn, we've got to grow. Uh, so, yeah. you know, now church, um, you know, again, probably predominantly white, um, you know, so, so can you, can you, do you even see racism in the church? Um, I think it would be unintentional. Mm. All right. It, it would just be because we, we like to do things when, uh, with who we're comfortable with. And so it's not, I mean, even in, in church and, you know, being, um, being honest, I've had to, try to um worship a little bit differently sometimes when i'm aware of it okay. because my family like they're always like mom you're so loud um <laughs> and you know because <laughs> and the end as so i do find sometimes it's like okay um you you need to you need to turn it down <laughs> because <laughs> and then they'll just like oh we heard you when we're coming in like if I came in first or something like that um and so I, I need to you know sometimes I'm, I'm I'm a bit more conscious than I want to because um I I understand like we're different people um and we worship differently like you know in Ghana it's even um the the type of um you know things that the songs like how people will sing and dance in church mm. is, is slightly different and so I try to adjust to that but at the same time for me um, as a Christian I know that in the presence of God is my happiest place wow, and yeah. so I want it to be my happiest place and I don't want it I don't want to be too overly conscious that I'm, I'm putting someone off just because I choose to worship in the way that I do um, but I still have to be conscious of that um, and sometimes it, it can be a little bit of a burden because every time if I, if I feel that, uh, oh, I, I need to pull myself back and that kind of might stop a bit of my, my flow and then try and get back into it, just trying to be mindful, um, let's say, of it. And so 
I, I don't think that people would intentionally, I mean, I've been to now church for um, over a year now, and I, I can genuinely say that people are really lovely. I don't think that people would be intentionally um, racist. It's just, you know, we're all comfortable to do things how we were used mm. to with who we, we like to do with and, you know, with people who we feel do things in a similar way um, to how we do things. It, it's natural. We, we all do that. And so it wouldn't be just um, the people um, at Now Church. I think it, it's, it's just human nature. Um, so th that is what I say. And we've got like presets um, with how we see things. So sometimes we get a bit nervous if, you know, someone, we feel that they might not see things the way we do mm. if, they, if we're doing something with them because we wouldn't, we're not able to control what the outcome would be. It's a bit more risky, if, if you get me. So yeah. you would want to go in to do it with someone that you know and you, you're more likely to, to be 100% what the result is going to be. So I, I wouldn't say it would be like an intentional form. I haven't had anyone be nasty to me or show me anything oh you know, but a smile um, when it comes to now church. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's good. I'm really, I'm, I'm really glad uh, <laughs> to hear that, but it's just, it is important because we've got to become yeah. aware of what we're not aware of. And I think, you know, that is for, for all of us white people, we've, we've just got to become more aware um, yeah. of it. So I don't think really until this week, yeah. I was aware of the privilege that I have as a white person. I wasn't, I didn't, yeah. I guess I wouldn't have thought that white privilege was a real thing it um, is i mean yeah i, I think I, I mentioned to you like you mentioned something that was was so um vital like you know to me and even how i saw this um thing my understanding of privilege um you a, a few months ago you talked about um being left-handed and how it, it affects certain things i think was it like things like christmas crackers and yeah, driving yeah. and you know Everything. things that i i didn't think about and and that's exactly what being in a privileged position is simply like being in a privileged position is just being um having something go in your favor or to your advantage that you have not contributed anything to that's mm. it you've not had to work for it you've not had to input for it it just you know come to you and a lot of like you know well, if we talk about being right-handed a lot of the design things are in our favor i've not contributed anything to the design but i'm privileged to be among the majority wow. who are right-handed so i don't have to think about it mm. and that's all it is it, it, it's about just stopping to think about it so that when we come into a position of power we can actually do more to influence it in a positive way Knowing what I know about left-handed, um, you know, being sometimes overlooked when it comes to design. If I was doing like, you know, a mug, for instance, I think I'll stop to think a bit more, question more about um, what about if, is this neutral enough or does this help um, people who are left-handed or could we create another version of it? So it's just being aware, um, not you might not even fully understand it because you don't have to deal with it, but mm. being aware and wanting to understand can help really impact uh, what we do with ourselves and also with other people as well. Yeah, that's, that's incredible insight. Uh, yeah. that. Thank you for sharing. So, you know, I think it's, we, we are becoming more aware, um, but I guess, you know, there's, there's a lot of people just desperate for, for something to happen and maybe that change has to happen uh, within all of us. I, I guess, you know, a big question, no pressure, but how, how should, I guess, the church respond? How should we as individuals respond, um, yeah, to, to, to what is happening in our world? Well, to be honest, my first, um, my first advice will go to black people. Um, and I think that, you know, we can we can't control how people treat us but we can control how we react to it i know there's a lot of frustration there's a lot of anger that's going round and you know it's understandable um but we have a perfect example in christ and it means that our anger our frustration it still doesn't justify us bringing hurt to other people Right. And it's what the world will say, two wrongs don't make it right. Wow. Um, so 
but at the same time on, on the other side is how are we how hard are we working to right a wrong all right mm. so that is for me my advice to black people and i know a, a, a lot of people might not be christians but being a christian is just it's just so critical like i mean it's it's life changing it changes the way you see yourself and that's what i always tell my kids like you know aside being uh, a black person if someone calls you stupid for instance you know that's not who you are and you know how you know because god says he created you in his own image and likeness and our god is not a stupid god there is no way that you accept something like that for yourself all right so it's important i think like identity you need to nail your identity and if you're a christian that should be a lot easier for you because you know that your identity as a child of god it supersedes any other identity that you can ever have and so that's really important we need to start being you know comfortable and bold in the the likeness and the image that god has created us to be and then we need to respond in the same way with a christ-centered approach so someone goes out to be disrespectful look george Floyd, he's he's lost his life for a good cause all right but it's not up to us to take things into our own hands and cause grief and hurt to other people and make it worse. How we can respond is to respond in love. Let's talk about it. And yeah. let's say that, let's deal with a situation. I'm black, it doesn't make me less human than you are and you should treat me in that same way with love, with respect. And, and that's the conversation and that's how we, we handle it. It doesn't mean that we should be walkovers. Um, Rosa Parks, for instance, I, I, I had to go back to her this week um, because she decided that she wasn't going to stand up on the bus um, in America mm. when she, you know, um, she had to, that was the normal. But she decided she wasn't going to stand up and she got arrested for that. She didn't mm. go around killing people for it, but it was a statement that she yeah. made. So the um, the deal here is we don't have to be quiet and be walkovers, but at the same time, we don't have to be violent and hurtful about it because that's only going to bring more pain. And that's not what it is. And that just goes on as well to, to tarnish some of the image. And so that makes it very easy to say, oh, angry black person, angry black woman, angry black man. But that's not what it is. It's, it's just boiling out of frustration. Yeah. And the church needs to listen. The, the church needs to, to make a stand because we're in a very um, privileged position. And that privilege is that we actually get to be children of God. It's through no effort of us. Um, and we need to, you know, um, we, we need to utilize that privilege we've got to send the message out to the world. It needs to start from us because I know wow. even within the church, um, sometimes we, we do sideline, again, out of comfort, um, we do sideline other people of different race just because we don't know what the outcome would be, just because we're not prepared um, to get out of our own normal. Um, and so we need to start doing a bit more, encouraging more of these, talking about it. We need to show love in, in those ways so that the people outside the church would know um, how to do it. it it's got to start from us that's it's incredible i love yeah i love that focus on you know my primary identity is a child of god um yeah. and if we could all have you know that like actually my my identity is as child of god so color is completely you know you, you don't think about color and so no and so as you know as as any person but me as a white person will actually know i'm a child of god you of yeah. as a black person you're a child of god um we're all children of god so let's see each yeah. other in that way as well as seeing ourselves as children of god yeah. you are a child of god you are a daughter of the king yeah. um you know and and therefore um you, you you completely need to be treated in that way um, yeah. and, and I think for me that that's it yeah that, that really is it because and I, you know there's something about um resting in that place of God and and that um honing on that identity you know really um owning up to our identity as Christ that changes the way we see things um mm. so 
when I, I know that for some people, like when they walk in, um, like maybe for now church, for instance, the first thing would have been, oh, there's a lot of white people here. But it might be because um, my family is mixed or, but I think it's more because for me, I, I choose to, you know, to, to own that identity very passionately. Yeah. But that's not the first thing that I see. I just see like, oh, I like the atmosphere. It's really nice. Awesome. Hey, so we were just, uh, yeah, talking about kind of we'd moved on from, uh, from white privilege, but you were saying, you know, for you, your identity is as, as a child of God. Um, and that's that's so important, so key. Um, you know, but it's remembering as well um, to speak out. Earlier, that you were in a private conversation as well. You referred to like kind of like um, you being reminded of a passage in Esther. Why don't you speak to us briefly about that um, as well? I think that'd be great. Yeah. So uh, I just um, I, I was really moved um, to do something you know and what I I could do I I just asked God but what can I do plus this is really going to disturb my peace because I don't really want to be controversial or just talk on on uncomfortable stuff Um, and I was taken back to Esther um, where Esther also felt that she couldn't um, find the right time to oppose the king or you know she she would be in his um, not in his disfavor and it, it was that getting up at that time that you have been here, for, you've been put here for a purpose. And, uh, you know, I, I told you personally, I haven't, I can't honestly say that, oh, I've been a victim of racism, like in works or probably in my church or anything. Like that. And I think a, a big part of it is what I've, I've shared with you. The fact that I, I don't look for it. And even if it's there, I probably won't see it because I'm going to give it as another reason because I, I see myself as a child of God. Um, I, and I, 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 you know, I, I think I, I mentioned personally that I hadn't experienced any um, kind of racism. Or, again, it, it might be the fact that I've not been looking for it or I don't put things um, down to it because um, I believe that you know, my identity as a child of God overrules everything. So even if someone may have had the intention of being um, racist um, to me, I, I wouldn't necessarily interpret it as that. Um, I, I can give, because there can be other interpretations apart from them just being racist. Um, so that's how I, 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 I do um, see things um, in that way. But what moved me this week was the fact that I can't just be silent you know, I can't just sit back and think that it's them, not me, um, I, because it, it will, it is us. Um, there's nothing like it's them and not me. It will come to affect us. I mean, we look at even the things that's going on in America, for instance. Um, if there's all these unrest, businesses are not really going to be able to progress. So it, it mm-hmm. does come round. And um, God spoke to me um, through Esther, uh, Esther chapter 4, verse 14. It said, um, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And that last part, I, I just, because the whole of this year, I have been telling God, I want him, I know that there is more that he wants me to do, and I've been looking, you know, um, and, and waiting on him. And so when I came, when he took me back to this, and it's just like, but God, what can I do? I don't, I can't really do a lot. But it's like, just what you can do is enough. Just wow. adding your voice, just bringing awareness to a situation, just, you know, helping to deepen and, and lengthen the voice of the people who have got a faint voice. That, you know, is enough for this time. If that's all you can do, then that's plenty enough. And that's what moved me. The you know whole of last week, I've just had so much unrest in my soul. I've been I've been writing articles. I've been you know just sharing messages. I've I've been reaching out my my you know the people around me, my circle, to bring awareness to the situation because most of the times we do things on autopilot we have seen things um just because of how we're brought up it's 
its influence, its culture, its experience. And if we're not, if we don't open our eyes to another way of seeing things, of doing things, then we can't really change from it. Um, I mean, I think what helps me as well is the fact that I come from another country. So being in the UK itself, I know that there are other ways of doing things. I'm not stuck in just one way. All right. I know that there are other languages because I, I speak more than just one. I know that there, when someone, um, you know, gets you something, there's, there's other way, there are other options. Um, but when all we know is the one thing, sometimes it's hard for us to do things differently. And that's all we have to do as, as children of God. That's what we want to bring to light. There's more than yeah. just this one thing. Um, maybe you're doing things just out of ignorance. You've never really thought about it. How does this look? How does this sound? How does this affect this person? And it's just stopping to think and then consciously trying to um, work to undo some unconscious things that have been, you know, built in us. And that's all that it, the conversation is about. That is incredible. Thank you. You speaking out has helped me personally. And I know that your voice into our church and all of those watching, um, you know, is, is such a powerful voice. Uh, and you, I'm just, you've made us aware, you've helped us, you've given us steps on what to do. So thank you so much uh, for this conversation uh, that I really do appreciate. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. Um, could you pray for us? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Father, we thank you for everything that you've been doing to lead us to this point. We know that your hand is in this situation and we know, oh Lord, that you love us. You love everybody because you created us in your own image and likeness. Father, I pray that as your children, you would help us, oh Lord, to send that message of love of light, of life, O oh Lord, in our actions, in our words, in everything that we do, O oh Lord, that people would see us and know that we are your children, to bring that peace and that love, that joy, wherever we are, and to glorify you in everything that we do. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Thank um, you. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll end this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you I'm so much gonna... for having me. Thank you.